All right, we're going to let Ross get started. I guess I don't need the mic right now. But he'll be talking about what does built by volunteers mean. And uh, he said that this might be a bit of a conversation. So if we do start talking, I'll be zipping around the room, handing the mic around uh, for you guys. So just I'll be as quick as I can on my feet. <laughs> we'll keep you fit. Yes. Our, our, ex our objective is, is to make Annie out of breath at some point <laughs> during the next 45 minutes. Um, so. I have a confession to make, um, and that confession is that um, I have no slides and I'm completely unprepared for this session. <laughs> However, don't worry, I have given this session before, which is why I thought I had slides, um, but I discovered about 15 minutes ago that apparently I don't. Um, but the, the session was only ever intended to be a conversation. Um, so we're a, a small group of people, and the goal here is to answer the questions about what does it mean to be built by volunteers. So ignore the title that's up there. This is a deck that, um, is, uh, that I will use to try and provoke conversation and guide me through making stuff up as, as, as we talk, okay? But feel free to interrupt if I'm not answering what you wanted to get out of this session. Interrupt and ask, okay? Um, so just to give me an idea of, of, of where we are, uh, who is a committer on, an, on a, an Apache project or any open source project? Okay, good. There's at least one person who can, can correct all the mistakes that I make. Um, who here is a user of an open source project? Okay. And so the rest of you, are you here just trying to, okay, what's all this about and, and how do we get involved and what does, how does it work? Is that, yeah, I'm seeing a few nods. Okay. Remember, I'm going, to make, I'm going to assume that that's what everybody wants. Most people nodded. That's great. Um, but um, d do ask questions. Do challenge. Do, uh, um, um, if you feel I'm saying something that isn't wholly accurate, then please do make your observation and let's discuss it. So um, what is a volunteer? Does anybody want to try and give me a definition of a volunteer? I'm quite happy to... Thank you, and that was exactly the thing I was hoping, and he isn't a stooge. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's what most of us think of when we, when we think of a volunteer, somebody who works for free. Um, but actually, if you look at the definition of a volunteer, it doesn't say anything about not receiving payment. It says somebody who does something voluntarily. I don't remember my deck that I should have would have the official definition, but it essentially is somebody who does something voluntarily. They're not being told to do it. They're just doing it for whatever reason they have decided to do it. And you get volunteers in all sorts of environments. You get volunteers who go and um, at the weekends go and volunteer to make sure that the crowds at the soccer game, um, oh gosh, I don't believe I said it's soccer. Sorry, you might detect that I'm English. I moved here for uh, uh, six months ago. And I swore blind I would never call football soccer. Seems I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can we, can we just erase the last 30 seconds, please? Um, yeah, my kids have started saying awesome as well, which is uh, another distressing fact. Yeah, awesome. And of course, I pick it up if the kids say it. Anyway, um, so there's people for volunteer for things like you know, crowd control and being the friendly faces at sporting events. There's people who volunteer to go into um, uh, disaster areas and help with all sorts of things in disaster areas, whether it be rebuilding the infrastructure or health, etc. And there's people who volunteer to do software. And that's what the Apache Software Foundation is all about and what most uh, projects are all about, what most open source projects are all about. And we, we at Apache, we often say that we build software, we have volunteers that build software. And the reason that we say that is because the way we're structured, nobody can tell you as a contributor to an Apache project what to do. Nobody within the foundation can tell you as an Apache contributor what to do. Only you can tell you what to do. Now, you'll have your own motivation for engaging with a project. It might be, as I started out, uh, I, wanted, I was at university and I wanted to do my final year uh, project and I wanted to do something that meant I could still go out at night and get drunk. And I discovered this open source stuff way, way back in the day when Yahoo had just started print, uh, publishing the stock market things. And I found some open source stuff that I could enhance and use it to do reporting on what the stock market was doing uh, by scraping Yahoo's um, pages. 
I got a first class honors. I didn't actually write the code. All I did was pull a load of open source code together and make contributions to it to enable it to do this thing. And little did I know that down the line, I would be making my career out of, uh, out of doing this kind of thing voluntarily. Now, you might notice that my slide there has Microsoft Open Technologies on it. I am paid by Microsoft Open Technologies. Until 12 months ago, I was paid as a consultant by various different companies that I worked for, and I'd always been paid by somebody to do my work after I left university. At university, I did it because it was convenient and easy for me. So I did it voluntarily unpaid. But every other job that I've done since then has been open source related and I've been paid for it. But never once did anybody inside the communities tell me what I could or couldn't do. They might say, we're not accepting that contribution because it's whatever the technical reason is. Maybe I've introduced a security hole or maybe it doesn't conform to the, standard, the coding standards or whatever. But nobody has ever said, we'll only accept a contribution for you if it fixes this bug. Because they can't do that. They can't tell me to fix that bug. I can decide for myself, well, that bug is affecting my contract, my, my employer, and so I will fix that bug. And I'm making a voluntary donation to ensure that my employer is happy with the work that I do. So that's what we mean when we say built by volunteers. But then that typically brings up in people who want to use software, and the title of this session is not what's on the slide there, the title of this session is, can I depend on software built by volunteers? And this is often a question that I, as a consultant, had to answer. People would say, well, I'm thinking about using this open source project here. Can you tell us whether it's viable? And most importantly, can we depend on it? Because there isn't a company backing this project. Now, often there were companies backing this project. There were people paying people to work on the project. But that was outside of the foundation. It was separate from the project itself. And people got confused by this word volunteer. So I think, you know, we don't want to lose the word volunteer because it's fundamental to the way we work, and we'll talk about that soon. But there is a negative connotation when you're looking at somebody purchasing a product that is based on an open source product. And that can sometimes be a problem for people making those, those uh, uh, relationships, building those relationships. So what I used to do, and, and this deck is, is what I use, one of the decks I use internally, uh, at Microsoft about what open source governance models are. What do they look like? It was a deck I put together for one of the business groups there. I wanted to understand what the different models look like. And so this tells you really how Apache can say, yes, if this is an Apache project and governed by the Apache policies and processes and decision making, there is actually a structure that means you can depend on software built by volunteers. Okay? So I'm going to quickly go through why we need those governance models. Again, I encourage you to interrupt uh, at any point, ask questions, amplify a point that you think I perhaps didn't make strongly enough, um, whatever you need to do. Do we need governance models? Since the foundation itself cannot tell volunteers what to do, and that means that the project management committees cannot tell individuals what to do, how do, we, how do we know we're going to get something useful out the end of it? And the concern that most people have when they're looking at this is, is what is the natural condition of humankind. And this was defined by Thomas Hobbes. It's always dangerous to put a philosopher quote on, this, on the screen because, of course, philosophy is always going to be people who agree and disagree. I'm happy to have the philosophical conversation if that's what we want to do. But Thomas Hobbes defined the natural condition of humankind as a war of all against all. And he essentially what he was saying was, everybody's out for themselves. It's built into us. It's a survival instinct. And we, we have to look after ourselves. And it's a, therefore a war of all against all. Now, of course, we can argue with that. But what's useful when we look at why he came to this conclusion is what the causes of the conflict are in what he described as a war. The first cause is competition. Competition for personal gain. So you want to improve your lot in life so you will compete with other people to have an improved situation. Diffidence, the idea of not saying I'm the best person in the world at this because that makes you a target for other people who are competing. So diffidence is for safety. Diffidence is not raising your head above the parapet. And then there's the glory, which is another type of person. 
that says, actually, I am the best in the world. Flock to me and you will win. And most people will have one or more of these characteristics around them. Glory is all about the reputation. So given these things that cause conflict, if we allow these things, the natural condition of humankind, according to Hobbes, if we allow these to rule within an Apache project or within an open source project, what we end up with is what people are scared of when they hear that this software is built by people who are free to make their own decisions and do whatever they want, is complete anarchy. How do we predict what we're going to get out from this project? How can we predict where it's going to go if anybody can do anything they want? Those of you who have worked on Apache projects know that we don't have anarchy in our projects. Far from it. So how do we get from the point of allowing everybody to be the person they are and contribute in the way they are to having a viable project? Well, the way we do it is we have this, this governance model. And the governance model is designed to prevent a project from deca decaying into, um, uh, into anarchy because we're allowing people to, to succumb to this war of all against all. What we do is we provide a license. The license provides the gain that previously was creating the competition. What the license does is it says, for this piece of code, you have exactly the same rights as everybody else. So there's nothing left to compete for, at least not at the resource level, at the bit noughts and ones. So we've removed competition by giving a license. And then we build a model that says everybody's equal. It's all about what you can contribute to for the bane, gain of everybody. And that gives safety because nobody is more powerful than anybody else, so nobody is becoming a target. And then we have a system which provides recognition for your contributions, large or small. So if you're somebody who wants glory, you can go out and get the glory there. If you're somebody who wants to just get on with your coding, you can get on and get on with your coding. But if you go after the glory, it's not going to give you any extra power. And that's fundamentally important. I'm one of those people who like recognition, like to be center stage, like to be known for what I do. It's part of my personality. It is part of who I am. I'm not going to change it. And that ultimately has meant that I've ended up at this point in time being the president of the foundation. But I don't have any authority over the projects that are represented in this room. None whatsoever. Because of this egalitarianism. So they're giving me the reputation I need to get the rewards I need. But at the same time, they're giving everybody else the safety that they need to be able to do what they need to do. So I'm going to go quickly over the decision-making models because I don't think it's relevant. But this is just background material about the different ways that we make decisions in day-to-day -day life. I'm not going to go into any detail over it because everybody will be familiar with these. You have hierarchies where somebody says, this is the way it will be. Um, We'll skip over the good and bad of each. We have majority rule, which is where you vote on every issue and the majority win out. I will highlight one of the problems there because people often think that Apache is majority rule because we have this concept of voting. Now, those of you who've contributed to Apache projects know that that's not the case at all. First of all, we hardly ever vote, which we'll talk about later on. And secondly, it's not a majority decision which, again, we'll talk later on. It's not about majority rule. And you only get a vote in an Apache project if you've earned the merit to have a say in it. So it's not majority. It's not a democracy. Uh, the next one is consensus. Consensus is much more like Apache is. Everybody agrees that that's the direction we're going to go in. The problem with consensus is, of course, is you don't always get everybody agreeing. And when you don't have everybody agreeing, that's when you get the conflict. So we need a decision-making process that avoids the conflict. We don't want hierarchy, because that's a top-down, you will do something. We're no longer volunteers at that point. We don't want majority rule, because we want to recognize everybody who is contributing as being equal to everybody else. And if we give majority rule, that means we're recognizing everybody who just happens to want to have a say. So that's not what we want either. So the nearest thing to what we want is consensus. And as I said, the problem with consensus is that you can sometimes not get everyone to agree. It's sometimes impossible to have everyone to agree. So we need to set, put a load of um, rules in place that allow us to make the right decisions 
the nearest thing to full consensus that we can get without crippling the decision-making process. Rules can cripple. Um, Max Weber said that bureaucratic administration means domination through knowledge. Okay, so if you've got a whole load of rules, there's two things can happen. The first is you look to the holder of the rule book to tell you what you should do given any situation. Well, that's a hierarchy. And the other thing that can happen is that nobody understands the damn rules. They're used as a, as a distraction to get your own way. And that's not what we want at all, especially not where people are, just want a result. So the, the, the thing here is that red tape will kill any idea. Anybody who's worked in a large organization and has sat on committees, I used to be in the academic sector many years ago, and committees in the academic sector are, so, well, any sector, are such a pain because they, they try to have everything covered by every possible angle. And in the end, you, you've got so much red tape, you don't see the idea. So what you need is a set of rules that bring balance to the situation. They, there's enough rules in place to make the model work, to make the volunteers able to be volunteers, independent of whatever rules are governing their decision process outside of the foundation. But also at the same time to prevent enough rules to prevent that anarchy occurring. Um, so not so long ago, the Open Source Initiative had this as the first sentence on their website. It's changed now. Um, the Open Source Initiative is, is, is arguably changing uh, it, its, its role in our, in, in our environment in the open source world. But not so long ago, uh, and they still believe this. It's not that they don't believe this anymore. It's just that they, they, they are uh, remodeling themselves. Um, what they used to say is that open source is, is a development method for software that harnesses the power of distributed peer review and transparency of process. Transparency of process, well, that's rules. And distributed peer review needs rules if you haven't got a hierarchy telling you who you're going to listen to. The key thing here is that a, a license is only a legal framework for collaboration. It's the thing that protects you. It's the thing that gives everybody the same benefits. But a license is not sufficient to provide a project environment in which you can rely on the volunteers. You know that the project can be managed and influenced to your benefit through the volunteer process. To do that, you need a social framework for collaboration. And that's what a governance model is. It provides you with the social framework. So what should that look like? Well, Einstein told us uh, when he was talking about physics, of course, that you should make everything as simple as possible but not simpler. And I think that's true of a governance model as well. What we need to do is define the absolute minimum rules that we need to ensure that the project can function, but no fewer. It's all about people. It's not about process. It's about the volunteers, and that's why we in the Apache Software Foundation, despite the sometimes confusion over what volunteers means, we don't want to remove the word volunteer because they are the most important people, the, the most important thing in the whole process. Without those people, there's nothing. So the process is important, but it's secondary. We need to empower those people. We can't direct them because if we direct them, then the foundation becomes something that is deciding what software is going to be built and how it's going to be built and what the feature set is. And that's not what the foundation is about. The foundation is about empowering people to build what needs to be built. So, how do you do it? Um, this is what we tend to think of as a governance structure within a typical project. We here being people in general, not the Apache Software Foundation. You have a project manager, they might have one or more advisors, then you have things like designers and programmers, and then you'll have testers and some other programmers, etc. And what we've got here is a hierarchy. But that's not what we want, because we established earlier on that a hierarchy doesn't empower volunteers. What you need is something that looks a bit more like this, where 
there is really, there, there is a central core that can make decisions, can break deadlocks, but actually the important people are out there on the periphery. It's the work that, the do, that everybody is doing that's important. You need a governance model that empowers those people, enables them to work. So we won't worry about what the little animations are there. Um, but how do you do that? How do you empower everybody who wants to come along and contribute, everybody who wants to volunteer, without falling into the too many cooks problem? The too many cooks problem being too many voices about how something should be done, meaning that you can, can't make any progress, or you just throw too many ingredients into it and it all falls apart. Well, again, it's back to that balancing thing. It's about having the right number of rules to make this happen. Although the, the, not number, the number isn't, isn't, isn't really relevant. It's the right set of rules to make this happen. It's about creating rules that get just enough to prevent it being a completely free-for-all environment. But not enough to prevent people doing what they need to do. It's about people versus process, and it's about empowering. So there's two popular governance models. Um, there's actually a whole spectrum of governance models. There's not just two. Um, but I like to pick these two because they are arguably at two ends of this spectrum and the most common and most popular, the ones that you can find most easily. You could go in either direction beyond each or you could, you could choose a different one as, as being the, at the end of this um, spectrum, the ends of this spectrum. But the two are benevolent dictatorships and meritocracies. So a benevolent dictatorship is the Linux kernel. It's a really good example of a benevolent dictatorship where it is, it's not really a hierarchy, it's still very flat, but there is one point of decision making. And in the case of the, Lin the Linux uh, kernel, it's Linus Torvalds. And he ultimately will make the final decisions if there is no consensus. And then you have meritocracies, which is the way Apache works, which is where you have a core group of people known as a project management committee who will break deadlocks if you can't come to consensus within the community. But for the majority of the time, they will step back and let the community do what they need to do. And the only real difference between those two models is how you break those deadlocks. It's not how you run the projects on a day-to-day -day basis, because actually, when you dig deep into the way the projects run on a day-to-day -day basis, they actually look almost the same. You have people contributing to mailing lists saying, I'm going to introduce, I'm, I'm planning on introducing this feature. I'm not quite sure the best way of implementing it. Here's what I think. Or you have people saying, I've already implemented this future feature. Here's the code. Is this suitable? Um, there's all sorts of conversations like that. And the same things happen. The only time that it changes is when you have two or more camps where one says A is the right route and the other says B is the right route. In a benevolent dictatorship, the benevolent dictator will listen to the community, listen to the arguments for and against, and eventually say, we're going to go with A, just to break the deadlock and move forwards. In a meritocracy, the community will listen to the position of the whole community, and hopefully, over time, they will come to a consensus and they'll say, we're going to go with A. Often in an Apache project, the way that happens is they say, OK, well, we can see benefits in both A and B. Why don't you just create a branch, start implementing it, and see which way the community start going? And the community will start to move towards one or the other implementation, perhaps because one implementation is moving more quickly. There's more resources available to it. We care about getting the code done. We don't care about getting it done absolutely perfectly. You can refactor code, you can rebuild code, etc. So progress is better than standing still and arguing about it. Very, very occasionally, a vote will be called. Now, don't call votes. Anybody got any ideas why I say don't call votes? If you have a vote, you have either, well, everybody's either a winner or a loser. You don't need to worry about your winners, but your losers, 
They've lost. Why would they volunteer to do something when they can't go in the direction they want? So don't call votes. Sometimes you have to. Sometimes there's no option. But it should be extremely rare. I could probably count them in 15 years of working on Apache projects and could probably count them for a number of times that a code vote has been necessary on, I'm not sure whether it be one or two hands, but it'd certainly be two hands at the most. What happens is you have the conversation. If you can't come to consensus at the conversation, you say, okay, fine, both go with it. We have a time machine in this version control thing. We can go back and we can integrate these things once we know which is the best route to take. And invariably with code, there isn't really a best route to take. There's different routes you could take. Getting to which point? If you get to a vote. Okay, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat the, the, it's an observation rather than a question, and the question is, do I agree? So the observation is, but if you're a volunteer in an organization, you know how the process works, and you do find yourself in a situation where you get to a vote, it shouldn't really be that big a deal. Um, it really depends on the community as to whether it's a big deal or not. There, there are projects that will use a vote as a power structure. And if I'm the only voice that sees a serious problem with this route, and everybody else on the PMC, for whatever reason, has decided to vote for the other route, then regardless of whether I respect the process or not, the fact that nobody else is listening to me is a huge problem, and I'm likely to walk away. Um, so it depends on why the vote comes about. If it's a good environment and it's not a case of people block voting against me because they just don't want to go that direction for whatever reason, it's actually a genuine community discussion and maybe I'm an idiot and maybe I got it wrong and I'm willing to accept the fact that I'm an idiot because everybody else is standing up against me. Well, that's okay, yeah. I think in that environment, it's no big deal. But how do I know, if I'm on the side of the majority, how do I know how those people on the minority side are feeling? How do I know that, 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 that actually I'm right? I believe in myself and I'm voting legitimately. How do I know I'm not damaging the community by doing that? But you know, it does get to the point that sometimes you have to break deadlocks. You, know, it, it's, you, can't, you can't not move. I would much rather, in every case like that, where it's getting to a vote, I would much rather say, let's just create two branches and let's just try it. Let's see what happens because I know then that if the person or the people in the minority are correct, when we start seeing code and we start seeing the churn going there, we start seeing the, the thing that they were trying to communicate through a very inefficient email exchange. Email is a hugely inefficient way of getting your points across. Code is actually very efficient. Um, then you know, that, it, it might seem like a waste of resources because we're going to throw some of that code away, but usually you'll, it won't take long before you can make that decision and you haven't had the damaging vote. You've proven to people that it was right or wrong. Yeah? yeah. Are you, are you the bug shutting? Bug shutting. Uh, bike oh, bike shedding. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, bike shedding. Great. Now is the time. Go with it. Bike shedding. Can he have the mic? Oh, sorry. Yeah, the term bike shedding, and I'll let you go into more detail, but I, I think when you have a decision, something causing anguish in the community, it's important to know whether you're talking about something that has technical significance, and it's important to get it absolutely right, because the history of mankind will depend on getting that one question right, or whether it's something of just small significance that everyone's weighing in on. And kind of a more mature community will be able to tell the difference between the two and know this isn't really worth having a lengthy discussion or a vote or anything. You know, it's, sometimes you're just giving your own opinion because you want to give your opinion because it's, it's, it's fun. Every, everyone likes having their opinion. Everyone, you know, if a pollster comes up to you and says, what do you think on these five topics of national interest? You know, most people are going to give their opinion. You want to. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so for those of you who haven't heard the term bike shedding before, that, that's exactly the, 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 the uh, results of bike shedding. And thanks for bringing it up. It's a, a great time to bring up bike shedding. Bike shedding refers to this concept where if you're talking about building, let's say, a skyscraper, the architectural complexities in building a skyscraper are actually pretty big. And most people haven't got anything to offer to that conversation about how you build this thing. But if you're building a bike shed, then everybody will spend forever discussing what color the bike shed should be. Because they can have an opinion on the color of a bike shed. They can understand the complexities of what's going on in building a bike shed. So I've got an opinion. And, and, and as you said, the people will, will, will just speak up for the sake of speaking up. And you're right, a mature community will be able to identify when that is and will have um, policy, not, not policies, it, it's more a social thing. It's more about um, uh, 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 people who have been around long enough to have seen this activity happening. There are ways that you can kind of divert past the bike shedding part of the conversation. And often saying, let's just go with the code and get the code out there is a good way of doing that because it stops the conversation about what color the widget's going to be and actually builds the widget. Um, and, and, and I think you know, benevolent dictatorships, if, if you do a search on how Lin, Linus Torvalds manages the communities within uh, the Linux kernel, you will very quickly find quotes where he's being quite rude and obnoxious. Right? Now, that's not his personality. It just happens occasionally. But of course, it makes good press when you have that kind of thing. So that's how he's quoted. But the key thing is Linus Torvalds is a genius social engineer. And he knows when somebody is bike shedding, and that somebody is of the personality type, that the only way to stop them to stop bike shedding is sometimes to be rude and obnoxious. Now, it's very, very rare. But if it's what's needed to get rid of somebody who's stopping things moving forwards, then it doesn't matter if it, I mean, personally, I, never, I try never to be rude and obnoxious. I try different approaches. But my approach is much slower than his which is probably why I'm not a benevolent dictator. I just try to smooth things over and be nice to everyone. I'm English. I have to do those things. It's in my blood. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's all about conflict resolution. And bike shedding is a form of conflict. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail over benevolent dictatorships, because that's not what we, what we do at, at the ASF. I do want to come to the decision-making point, though. Um, because I want to draw the parallel between what a benevolent dictator does and what the ASF does. A, a good benevolent dictator will always recognize other people. You, you talk to Linus Torvalds any time, he will tell you he hasn't got a clue about most of what's going on within the kernel, the modules that are around it, and all that kind of thing. He understands how the thing needs to fit together and how it needs to be built to provide what it, what the, the right thing for the community. He understands the high-level stuff, but he doesn't understand every single bit of code that people are writing in modules that are plugging into the kernel, etc. He's one man. He can't do that. He's, he's probably, well, he is a far better technical mind than I am, but even as the genius that he is, he can't deliver on everything. So he will recognize others who can deliver and fill the gaps in his expertise and his knowledge. If he didn't do that, those people that know more than he does about topic A would get frustrated that he's not listening to them about topic A, and they would walk away. And he wouldn't be building a community. So he listens to others, or any BD listens to others. And he, he, he will listen to leaders within the community. Now, one of the things, because, because a benevolent dictatorship creates a hierarchy, um, you also tend to find that there are other leaders within the community who are designated as leaders. Um, so Linus Torvalds in the Linux kernel, he, he, he has his, oh, I forget what he calls them now. What does he call his module? Sorry? Lieutenants, that's it. Thank you. So he actually names people and highlights them. That's a, that's a significant difference to what we do at Apache. We don't have any named roles in Apache. Well, we do, but they don't carry any, any, um, any weight. And I'll tell you about some of them in, in a short while. Um, so he, he, a benevolent dictator will sometimes listen to others over and above others, but they are seen as benevolent dictators within their part of the, of, of the project. Um, and his role is not to make decisions. His role is much more of a chairman type role. Make sure everybody's voice is heard, listen to it all, and then make the decision quickly. 
He doesn't care about potentially making the wrong decision as long as he's making an informed decision. Um, so he does that by, by making sure everybody hears him. Very often, a benevolent dictator will not actually make a decision. They won't need to because in the course of getting everybody to discuss the options and the things that are available, everybody finds, oh, actually, we're in agreement. Go do it. And they just start doing it. Nobody actually needs to say, this is what we're going to do. So this is how we're empowering our, our, our participants. The benevolent dictator in the decision-making process does break the deadlocks. Okay? So where we were talking about potentially bringing up a vote earlier, never happens in a benevolent dictatorship because the benevolent dictator says, let's not waste any more time discussing this. I've listened to all the arguments. For these reasons, I'm going to say we do this. If he makes a justifiable decision, he has the respect of his community because he listens to his community and they will respect the fact that he's helping the project move forward. And hopefully, we'll be in that position that you asked about a moment ago, that if it gets to that stage and you understand the process, aren't you going to be okay with losing out on that decision? Well, if a benevolent dictator does a good job, then yes, you'll be okay with it, because you will, but that BD will have your respect. I know I've lost votes over code in the past, and I've never got upset about it, because I've respected the people around me. If, you don't, if they hadn't built that respect by listening to me in the first place, and telling me why my position isn't correct, then I would have probably been a bit more upset about it. Uh, we don't want to worry about roles, responsibilities. It's fairly, uh, fairly obvious. Oh, actually, there is an important point on that slide, which is the community, the two community points on the right, that community contribute patches, community review patches. So the benevolent dictator is typically responsible for putting the code into the, into the, into the project, into the version control. But the benevolent dictator isn't the only person reviewing the code. There are other people reviewing it and providing their input and advice where appropriate. Um, advantages of BDs, um, it's a really simple structure. You don't get into this complex thing about, well, we'll get to the difficulties of meritocracies in a moment, but it avoids the complexities that you get in, hierarchy, in uh, meritocracies. Perhaps the biggest problem, though, is, is the benevolent dictator neutral? Okay, and the title of this session is, Can We Depend on Projects Built by Volunteers? Well, if those volunteers are being herded, if you like, as in herding cats, by somebody who is not neutral, then depending where you sit on the BD's position, you can either trust or you can't trust. So an example would be um, when... MySQL was, was MySQL. It was just a small company in Sweden, I think. Wherever it was. Um, it wasn't Sweden. It was... Um, anyway. Um, when it was a, a, a small company, people trusted it. They felt that they were relatively neutral. Even though it was a GPL project that they said categorically, you will give us our copyright and we will sell other licenses. People accepted that and said, no, that's fine. You go ahead. That We trust you. Then the company was bought by Sun, and the community said, hmm, do we trust Sun? And ultimately they said, yeah, we, we can trust Sun, that's okay. They're, been, they're, they're, they're fairly neutral to how the project is going to go in the, in the future. And then when Oracle bought it, it forked. The community said, no, we don't like it. Same thing with Office. So is it, can you depend on the volunteers? Depends on who is herding those volunteers. In a benevolent dictatorship, you need to look at whether neutrality exists or not. In the case of the, uh, the, the, um, the Linux um, kernel, of course, uh, Linus Torvalds works for the Linux Foundation, which is a fairly neutral environment. I mean, it's not entirely neutral. It's a 501c6, so it serves its memberships. But anybody can be a member, and it has a decision-making process that's transparent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and people are comfortable. It is neutral. And so people will flock to it and contribute. The ASF is a similar kind of environment. It's a 501c3. We're a charity. We legally have to be neutral, unlike a C6. But our processes are no more or less transparent than those you will find elsewhere. And so we are seen as neutral. It's extremely efficient. As soon as things start going around in circles, or as soon as somebody is bike shedding, it gets stopped. Um, Unfortunately, though, there's a single point of failure. 
Okay, so assuming we have got a neutral uh, a benevolent dictator, but she makes a mistake, that's, that's a failure point, and how do you change that? It's hard to change that if that's the, thank you, if that's the, um, uh, if that's the one point of control. Um, and I would ask her, you ought to be in a benevolent dictator. I mean, I know I'm not. A good benevolent dictator is, oops, I seem to have blanked it, there we go, is uh, a diplomat, a technical leader, and a social engineer. There aren't many people in the world who are all three of those things. I know I certainly am not. So there's no way I could make a good benevolent dictator. Meritocracies, on the other hand, which is what Apache is, um, in our organization, merit earns authority. Now, how's that different from a benevolent dictator recognizing the people in the community who are contributing? Now, we have a formal way of recognizing it and acknowledging it, and in a benevolent dictatorship, there's an informal way. But actually, it's pretty much the same thing. That person is contributing and is of value. I'm going to listen to that person. What we do is we say that person has contributed to an Apache project, so we're going to give them this label, which means that the community needs to listen in the event of a dispute. Any contribution earns merit, also true in a BD. Perhaps most importantly, though, facilitating contribution earns merit, and this is one of the differences between uh, a BD and or potentially one of the differences between a BD and an Apache project. We formally, formally recognize people who build community, who don't necessarily write code, but build community and bring new people to the projects. Whereas BDs don't necessarily do that. They might do, depending on the individual who is a BD. Um, where we, we begin to differ, though, is in the decision-making process. We're leaderless. A meritocracy is leaderless. Everybody is equal, remember. So there is no concept of a BD being able to make the decision for the community. The community makes the decision. Um, what that means is that um, we have to rely on people doing the right thing. And we can do that because most actions are reversible. In a software project, almost all actions are reversible. You can take version control and roll back a little bit. Now, there are some things, if you're spending money on marketing, for example, that are not reversible. So you need to be careful. You have things to, to police that. But code, hey, it doesn't matter if somebody introduces a security hole in the development branch of the code that we're working on. It's not going to tear down the world as long as we don't release it with that security risk in it. And we've got a time machine to take it back or to give us time to fix it. So because everything is reversible, we have this concept called lazy consensus. And if you only take one thing away from today, lazy consensus is the most important thing. This is what makes it possible to rely on code made by, built by volunteers. What it says is, because most actions are reversible, just let people get on with doing what they need to do because the people who've been given the authority to do that, being given right access to the code, have shown that they understand the development model that makes these software projects great, what, that makes these things work. So they're not going to go in there and deliberately put a bug into the system. They might do it inadvertently, but they're not going to do it deliberately. So you trust people and just let them get on with it. And the reason we need to do that is because our conflict resolution process is not as quick and efficient as it is in a benevolent dictatorship. So where the benevolent dictatorship has a single point of failure, because you have a review process, et cetera, that, 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 and the commit process, and they lose a, there's a bottleneck at that point in a benevolent dictatorship, we don't have that bottleneck, but we do have a bottleneck in the conflict resolution process. So we need a, we, 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 you know, the two things balance out. Lazy consensus is critical. If you are making a contribution to a project that you genuinely believe is of value to that project, just go ahead and do it. Don't ask for permission. Don't ask for consensus. Don't ask for anything. Just assume that you can go ahead and do it. Now, if you're going to do something that's controversial, all right, maybe you want to have a conversation first. But you make that decision as to whether it's controversial or not. There's a whole review process in place that allows people to say, oh, hang on, I see you've assumed lazy consensus on that, but actually, there's a problem here. 
and this is the problem. And there's a process for rolling back time, reversing those changes, and fixing the issue if necessary. But 99 times out of 100, it's not necessary. You just keep rolling forwards. Um, and that's review, review, then commit, commit, then review. I won't go into details. We'll be, we'll be needing to run out of time. But that's the process by which we do reviews. And it changes depending on whether you are a committer, somebody who has right access, who's earned the merit to have right access to the version control, or whether you are a contributor. Um, we won't worry about roles and responsibilities, apart from to point out that those two bullets that I said were important on the BD, they're there as well. Community contributes patches, community reviews patches. There's very little changes. The next slide is what changes. Oh, I thought it was the next slide. Maybe it's the next one. It's not. The conflict resolution is where it changes. Okay? Um, so the conflict resolution process is the difference between the two things. Now, People will tell you there are a lot of other differences, and of course, if you want to get down to the nitty-gritty detail, there are subtle differences all over the place between the two models and the various points on the within in between. There's not just two ways of doing open source. There's an infinite number of ways, and there are many differences between them all. But the only real difference is conflict resolution. The only truly important difference is conflict resolution process. Here at Apache, we believe you need to, conflict, to, to resolve the conflict in a way that guarantees neutrality. And that's what we try to do with our processes. In the benevolent dictatorship, they say, no, you need to find an individual who guarantees neutrality. Both work if you find the right people to run it. So the last thing I want to say is that on the surface, a benevolent dictatorship looks like a hierarchy, looks like a power structure, and a meritocracy looks, at, looks like majority rule, but it's not. In neither case, a benevolent dictatorship would not be a benevolent dictatorship if the community didn't follow because they have a license that protects them. They can take the code and walk away at any time. So if the BD is not doing a good job, they walk. In the case of a meritocracy, it's not a democracy. You only get a say in it once you have proven your ability to be or your, your, your contributions are worthy of having a say in the project. So it's not a meritocracy, so it's not majority rule. The only difference between the two is how deadlocks are broken. So can you rely on volunteers? If you have a minimum set of rules in place to allow the volunteers to do what they need to do, then yes, and it doesn't really matter what those rules are as long as the volunteers are able to contribute in a manageable way. Because if you're going to rely on software built by volunteers, chances are you're going to get engaged with the project in some way, either directly investing resources into it or indirectly paying somebody who uses that software to provide a service or a product to you. So as long as there is a governance model in place that prevents it going into the anarchy that we, can sit, we think of when we talk about unruled volunteers, then yes, you can. And of course, the whole industry these days is built on open source to the extent that I now work for Microsoft Open Technologies, which 10 years ago I would, say, would have said was not going to happen. Yet now I'm extremely happy to be there because we can now take, uh, contribute to and benefit from these kinds of processes. Okay, not bad since I didn't have any slides. I know I had a lot of slides, but it wasn't the deck that I wanted for this. <laughs> We've got two minutes. Any questions? What do you find is um, in kind of giving this talk more and more to different people is most effective on the business side? Like what resonates with the business to go, oh, I can trust volunteers now? That's a really good question. Um, give me a moment. Um, what resonates more? I think when I'm talking to, to so here we're, we're, we're people looking at contributing to the community. So the, uh, the emphasis has been on the community and the strength of the community and the volunteers within the community. I think when I'm talking to somebody who is looking at investing in some way in an open source project, using an open source project in a strategic or a product environment, the emphasis switches to um, how they can get involved with the decision-making process. 
So how they can empower their staff to become volunteers in these projects and be equally as powerful as these volunteers and influential, powerful is the wrong word, influential is the right word. Um, and I think that's what usually tips it, when they say, oh right, so you're saying we take our good engineers that we were gonna have working on this project anyway, and we have them work within the community as opposed to behind these walls, then they will be recognized and they will be able to make decisions for the benefit of the project, which will benefit us. That's, I think, I've never really considered the question before, and I know that's one I'll be thinking about as I'm driving back to, to, tonight. Um, it's a really good question, but I, my gut reaction is it's, it's that you can be volunteers as well. Okay, thank you.